in just a second here. Okay, you're all set. All right, thanks so much for the opportunity, Christy, and the introduction. And thanks for everybody who's on the call today because it is Memorial Day and it turned out to be an unexpectedly beautiful day. And maybe um, uh, a lot of people are still outside playing or having a socially distant picnic, but I'm ha really happy and grateful for everybody who was able to come today. Thank you. Um, so name of, of my presentation is Marvelous Mucus, learning about the little known world of land snails. And again, my name is Marla Coppolino. I achieved Master Naturalist Level 3 last year. I'm also a research associate at both the Paleontological Research Institution in Ithaca, New York, and the Delaware Museum of Natural History, and mostly for outreach and teaching others about land snails, because that really is my passion. Oops. Okay. Um, a, a lot of people ask me how I got into snails and where did this all start, and really started from childhood. And when I was about 10 years old, I turned over a snail it, that I found in the forest and I looked very, very closely at it and I found uh, that I could actually see its beating heart through the translucent shell. So I'm going to play this video for you and uh, hopefully... I think they can still hear me. Can you still hear me? Yeah, good. Um, so if you look in this section right here where my cursor is circling, uh, the snails have a two-chambered heart. Uh, it has a ventricle and an atrium, and it, you see this pumping action here. Uh, they're actually pumping their very translucent, slightly bluish blood through their system. And they have a partially closed circulatory system, uh, and uh, the, the heart it can be visible beating through many snails' translucent shells. And when I was 10 years old, this fascinated me, and I always thought, I just want to share this with everybody else. It's just, it's too amazing to keep to myself. And I don't think I ever look at the beating heart of a snail without still feeling that same feeling of excitement and wanting to share. Oh, good. Okay, so there's three basic parts to my presentation this evening. I'm going to talk about land snail biology and ecology, and then at the end, ways that every one of us can get involved in uh, conserving and learning and passing it on to others. Starting with biology, as um, you might already know this, uh, invertebrates are a huge group of the animal kingdom. And we like to say they're spineless, but they're the backbone of nature because they're so important. They're often at the bottom of the food web uh, uh, invertebrates are everything from uh, jellyfish and insects and hydra and SpongeBob SquarePants and all his friends. They're also <laughs> actually invertebrates, ex with few exceptions in the program. One is the whale and the other is Sandy the squirrel. Uh, and snails are invertebrates. If we want to drill down a little further, the animal kingdom is divided up into phyla. Uh, the phyla mollusca is where snails are placed. And um, as you can see, many of these mollusks you know and recognize from beach expeditions. If you ever go shell collecting, you will find shells on the beach and those are indeed of mollusks. Uh, even also octopus and squid are also mollusks. They don't have a shell, uh, but they're still co close cousins and the nautilus. And then we have the land snail. Going down a little further, we have freshwater snails, marine snails, and land snails. Those are the three major groups of snails. And today, of course, we're going to be talking about land snails. Whenever I say snails, I really also mean to include slugs as well, because they're snails too. They're just snails that evolved to not need a shell. All their organs are uh, uh, contained within this area, which is called the mantle. And we'll talk more about that in the coming slides. This is a leopard slug. Many of you have probably seen this, maybe in your garden or maybe at the bottom of your house. Uh, they're an invasive species that are uh, pop up here and there in, uh, uh, around our neighborhoods. All right, so land snails evolved from their marine ancestors. How did they do that? You think, you know, a marine snail has everything it needs. It's a squishy animal and has moist skin. Well, 
land snails manage to be survivors of land by these points here. Uh, and we'll start with mucus. I think everybody knows who has held a snail in their hands even for a moment that they're pretty darn slimy, right? Mucus. So the mucus acts as a barrier between the air and their moist bodies. And the mucus is composed of proteins that are cross-linked with metals, a very interesting composition, uh, serving the purpose of protecting the snail from drying out. And that's really its number one threat is drying out. Uh, the mucus also helps it glide along and move along, it aids in reproduction, and other things. Nocturnal behavior, most snails you don't see because they're having their activity around the, the, in the evening and the night, in the dead of the night, and even in one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, the snails are uh, happy to be out because there's, there's moisture, humidity, coolness, and no sun, of course. So if you have a headlamp and like to look for snails, the nighttime is the really be the best time to go. Homing behavior means snails have a tendency to keep returning to the same place. So if there's a fallen log in the woods or in your property, you will always find the snails there because they'll go out and they'll look for food and they'll have their day but or their night <laughs> and they'll return to the log because homing um, towards it, I guess you could say, because it's safe and they know that it's covered, it's sheltered, and there's a lot of moisture in there. Finally, snails hibernate in the winter and estivate in the summer. All of you are familiar with the word hibernation. Just like a bear hibernates, so does a snail. It tucks into its shell, it, it burrows down a few inches under the soil, and then puts out a protective barrier of mucus, which hardens and forms something called an epiphram, and it stays there until the spring months warm it up. And meanwhile, the snail is protected. Um, in its blood, it has the same kind of uh, glycerin compounds that are found in frogs and fish and other animals, insects too, that are able to withstand freezing temperatures, below freezing temperatures. And that helps keep the blood from crystallizing and the tissues from crystallizing when they freeze. And estivation, maybe fewer of you are familiar with that word, but that is uh, um, a period of rest and inactivity in the summer. So uh, just like with the winter, they can't function when it's very cold. Snails also can't function when it's very hot. Uh, the heat, uh, and especially the sun, can really dry them out. So if you get a stretch, uh, of, of course, up here in New York State, and especially in upstate New York, we get these stretches once in a while of a week or two weeks of 90 degree temperatures. And that's usually a time when the snails are going to be inactive and estivating. Same thing, they burrow onto the ground a bit and then they uh, provi have a protective seal on the opening of the shell and they just stay inactive until temps cool off and it's raining. Snails have all these basic parts. Uh, for those of you who are gonna be watching the recording of this, you can stop the video uh, at any time. Some of my slides have some uh, complicated bits on them. Uh, snails are a bit alien compared to any vertebrate plan of the body. Uh, they have this interesting uh, way, a lot of people would, would naturally think that, uh, same like in insects, that the food passes through the snail's body and ends up the anus might be at the end of the tail. No, not so with snails. The, um, you'll see in this next slide, <laughs> that's what it looks like on the inside. And the snails uh, have a very complex set of organs that are not unlike uh, mammalian organs even, or avian organs. And uh, everything in the snail goes through, moves through the digestive system and, and the urinary system, everything else, and then it exits out the front. And you see that right. The snail's penis and vagina end up in the neck of the snail and mating takes place in a most unusual way compared to most animals. We'll see a bit about that too later. Uh, I'm gonna just run through some of the basic functions of a snail. Uh, they uh, have to eat, right? And uh, the way they do is with a mouth. And this uh, image on the right is a cutaway cross-sectional side view to get you oriented of the snail's 
mouth. Uh, and that's the opening of it. And this is the food going down the esophagus. The blue represents the food. Um, this part in yellow represents something called an odontophore, which is a, a kind of a cartilage, cartilage kind of uh, structure. And above it, this is the most important part, is the radula. The radula of a snail is a ribbon uh, of chitin material that's very neatly organized with rows and columns of tiny barbs, which are essentially like act like teeth. But it doesn't chew, it scrapes. And radula comes from a Latin word that actually means to scrape. So here's what a uh, radula looks like magnified many times. So all those little barbs are just scraping the food. These are muscle groups to control it and it swallows. So another thing that happened when I was about 10 years old was that I noticed that you could actually hear snails eating, the larger ones anyway. And so um, I uh, held up a snail to my ear and I would hear it eating and I would tell everybody, I can hear the snail eating. And uh, people didn't believe me and children can be cruel and they made fun of me. But I wanted, I said to myself, someday I am going to prove to the world that you can hear a snail eating. And so I did. So several years ago, with the help of a sound um, engineer and naturalist, Lang Elliott, who lives in Ithaca, helped me to make the recording. So you're about to hear. This wonderful sound of snails rasping a carrot. Now that's not a food they might eat necessarily in nature, but I gave them a carrot to ensure that we could hear the snails chewing, rasping, sorry. Isn't that amazing? And that's with a high powered microphone amplified a good bit up, but you can actually hear them chewing, rasping rather. Pretty cool, huh? Snails drink too. Again, they are always losing moisture and they have to keep up their um, internal moisture and it's protected by the mucus, but they still need to fill up with water. Snails will both absorb water through their skin and they will also uh, drink water. And so if there's a, a um, container of water in your terrarium of snails or a puddle somewhere, that's they will just lap it up. How do snails breathe? Well, this is another strange thing. It's There's no nostrils at the head end. Rather, instead, if you look, if you turn up a shell, you'll see a hole. You won't always see it. It tends to open and close, not necessarily rhythmically, but it'll once in a while open. And when it does, the snail is taking in air. And uh, if you remember that internal slide, the snail has a lung inside this portion of its shell and gas exchange occurs. The snail takes up oxygen and releases carbon dioxide. So think of that, that pneumostome. It's a single pneumostome. There's only one on the snail, not two. And it will open and close uh, as the snail is taking in oxygen and letting out carbon dioxide. How snails get around. This large muscular structure is, is not their stomach. As you know, the organs are inside the shell, but this is called the foot, and it's not at all analogous to any vertebrate uh, or mammalian foot or anything like that. It's just a large muscular structure. The snail has uh, very neatly organized groups of muscles and sends ripples in a prograde fashion so if you have a snail that's stuck to a side of a, a glass or an aquarium, you can watch it move along by the waves of ripples that uh, move forward, grip the glass in front and pull the snail forward. It, it's quite fun to watch it. So um, everybody wonders this part, how do snails reproduce? Well, um, these are amazing little animals and they are, for the most part, most snail species in the world are hermaphroditic. And that means they contain both male and female parts. They can the, make both eggs and sperm in one individual. Uh, and uh, a most fascinating thing I love to share about snails is that many species make something called love darts. And um, I'm telling the truth. I uh, have uh, recorded many snail matings 
with love darts this here it looks like a little ice pick that is a calcium barb the snail produces it from a gland and then believe it or not it shoots it not through the air don't think dart like a cupid dart um, but it very close proximity it plunges a dart into its partner one of my snails one morning had a love dart right through its head oh my and this doesn't really hurt the snail um, and for decades, scientists wondered what's the purpose of them. Oh, by the way, you see down here, each different species of snail makes a different style of love dart. Isn't that amazing? These are some love darts I collected from my own terrarium. This mark is one centimeter, so you can get a feeling for their size. So um, the current thinking in, more than thinking, some experiments showed, uh, uh, some uh, proteomics showed that the tip of the love dart contains a little bit of hormone and the hormone we believe uh, not it's not for really enticing the other snail to mate but it's for having the recipient snail retain the sperm of its mating partner there can be multiple mating so as there are many competitions in nature uh, every uh, uh, male or male acting animal in this case is hoping that its sperm will be the ones that fertilize the recipient snail's egg. A lot of times the snails are gonna exchange love darts and sperm. Quite fascinating. If you liked that, um, I highly recommend you take a look at this video because snails uh, do it one way, okay? And um, slugs, all different species of slugs have different ways of mating. The most fascinating by far to me is the Limax maximus slug, which we do have around here. And they have this courtship ritual and they intertwine around each other and they hang from a branch in the forest. This usually happens in the middle of the night and believe it or not what you're seeing here are two everted penises and they intertwine and they exchange sperm that way. So it's external uh, and quite interesting. So um, uh, we all know and love Sir David Attenborough who has given us many wonderful nature documentaries. Um, so if you go to this link, you can watch uh, this uh, segment about slugs in a mating ritual. It's beautiful, beautifully lit, beautiful music. You'll enjoy it, I believe. What happens after mating? So you got fertilized eggs and the snail makes a depression in the ground and it lays its eggs. Uh, snails can lay anywhere from two to a hundred eggs, sometimes more. This uh, particular snail laid 77 eggs, as far as I remember counting. There they are, beautiful little pearls under the soil. The eggs stay and develop for about three weeks. The parents have no part in the care of their young. And the snails are direct developers. So unlike a lot of, you might think of insects or, or other invertebrates who go through instars and metamorphosis, no, not so with land snails. They hatch and they have this little whirl of a shell. And then what happens is they gradually grow more whorls. So think of it this way, snail growth. It's not that the shell is getting bigger, but rather that the shell is accumulating more whorls around its central point. So by the time the snail has reached three months of age, you can still see that center whorl right there. That was that three months ago. I made a, uh, an infographic about it that can help you understand it a little better. Um, this is just a very simplified uh, way of seeing the snail uh, just place down more spirals. So again, it's, not, it's growing bigger, but in the form of spirals. Quite interesting. Okay, you're wondering why I put this here. Well, the interesting thing is that spiral forms in nature are very common. And if you ever let your fingernails grow long enough, oh my, well, they form spirals too. So this was a man in India, and maybe if you have seen this, this was a few years ago, it was on all the news networks. Uh, and for whatever reason, perhaps re religious ritual, I don't know, I'm not judging. He wanted to grow his fingernails for 25 or 30 years or maybe longer. I don't know. It was a very long time. And I was just noting, wow, they grow like snail shells, or at least his thumb did. So um, that, that's kind of interesting. It's just a natural 
a pattern in nature. Spirals appear a lot in nature, so good, good to know. Plants too. Plants often grow, have spiral, you know, when uh, new ferns uh, unfurl the, the uh, fiddleheads. That's what I was trying to say. Fiddleheads are also spirals. Now, um, something important I, I want everybody to learn tonight about snails is that many species of snails, actually most, are very, very small. 95% of the snail species in New York State are smaller than a lentil. What is that size? It looks something like this. So this is a pile of snails under magnification. The scale bar represents five millimeters, approximately lentil size. That gives you a feeling of how small snails can be. A lot of people tell me, we don't find snails. There aren't any snails on this property. Well, I ask, um, maybe let's take a few minutes and look. And oftentimes I can turn over logs or look through the grass and I can find a number of really tiny snails. And it's a very happy thing that we know, well, they are there. We just have to look very carefully. This is a photo I made um, a while ago and it shows you even better. Uh, here's a penny. And these are different species of snails that are among the smallest species of snails in North America. Look how tiny Guppia sturkii is. That is uh, hardly bigger than the top of the letter T in Liberty. Amazing. So um, now that we know some of the basics about land snail biology and what snails are and how they work, I'm going to talk a little bit about ecology now and how they interact with their environment. Okay, um, so when we talk about snails, because they are generally small and some are very, very small, we don't really tend to talk about habitats, but rather microhabitats. And we talk about them because when you lift a log or even a piece of bark or even sometimes a leaf, there's a whole community of snails under there. And you can find those tiny snails in leaf litter. You could find them on vegetation, in the soil, so in grass. So again, microhabitats when we're talking about snails is what we're really saying here. And what are they doing in their microhabitats? Well, snails are taking up the essential nutrients from everything they're eating there. And most snails, no, they're not eating carrots in nature, but rather they're munching on leaf litter and, and fungi and, uh, and decaying vegetation. And in the process of doing so, they're taking up calcium and zinc and all these essential nutrients. Then what happens is they're moving those nutrients up the food web by becoming prey to other animals. And this is one of the keys of why snails are so important in nature. Who doesn't love fireflies? Everybody loves fireflies. And I try to tell people that if you love your fireflies, you ought to also enjoy snails and appreciate them because the firefly larvae specialize on different species of snails. How about that? Other animals that eat snails are reptiles. Everything from snakes and lizards and turtles uh, love to munch snails. Often, uh, most of them will actually chomp down on the entire shell and all, doesn't matter, crunch down. That They're getting nutrients, they're getting calcium from the shell and proteins and plenty of protein, lots of nutrients also from the fleshy part of the snail. Everybody knows our local red bat salamander, common in New York State throughout, I believe. Uh, they eat snails too. Oftentimes when I lift a log and I see salamanders, I say, ah, there must be snails under here and slugs too, and there are. Or if I don't find any, I realize that it's because the salamander probably had some for lunch. So the salamanders, uh, the perfect food is snails and slugs. It gives them just what they need. Moving on, a lot of birds have to have snails as part of their regular diet. If they don't, they cannot lay viable eggs. There are two studies I list here uh, that are relevant to uh, songbirds uh, and what happens in polluted areas when you have uh, acid rainfall, acidified soils, 
acidified soils, what do you think that does to the snail populations? Well, it reduces them because snails are calcium loving animals. It takes a lot of calcium to build the shell. Cal snails carry a lot of calcium throughout their body. And when you have uh, losses of snail abundance, you're gonna have poor reed production in the birds and you're gonna have decline of population of birds. And birds get so much attention in the world of nature conservation, animal conservationists, birds, uh, and the general public can readily appreciate and gravitate towards birds. Well, if you love your birds, please also respect snails. Here's a song thrush. This is the uh, European equivalent of our local wood thrush, very similar bird. And our wood thrush also thrives on snails. If the female thrushes don't get enough snails in their diet prior to laying their eggs, they cannot lay viable eggs. The embryos cannot develop, the eggs won't hatch. Um, you can also get uh, flimsy shells. Uh, unlike mammals, birds are not able to sequester minerals from their bones to their developing embryos. So uh, mammals can do that. They can sequester calcium from the bones to the developing fetus, but that's not the case for birds. They actually need to be consuming a lot of snails. So great, two great studies that demonstrate that. Turkeys. Um, we have plenty of turkeys uh, throughout New York. Uh, there's a great paper also that you can uh, look up online. It's uh, the Rio Grande turkey hens, a closely related species of uh, what we have here. Uh, and it showed, in a nutshell, I'll just tell you, the females were found to consume 30% more snails than usual before they were going to lay their eggs. So that just shows snails are very important to the diets of birds. And you remember those tiny snails we were looking at a few slides ago? That's what they're eating. And we may not be able to find the tiniest snails in the grass, but the turkeys sure do. This, this flock of turkeys comes through my property on occasion and they're pecking at the grass and they're eating snails. Even mammals eat snails. Chipmunks, who you might think make classically eat nuts and, and acorns and things. No, they also eat snails. So if you ever find some snail shells that have this kind of top, uh, the spirals have been broken away, the chipmunks do that with their teeth. They break away the top spirals and then they eat the inside. So they don't like to eat the shell. Some animals do, some don't. They open them like that, kind of like a can of sardines. Some snails eat other snails. Whenever I have a group that's collecting with me, I always tell them, if you can't identify any other snail in your collection, please know what Haplotrema concavum is. I'm sorry I didn't put the uh, common name. The common name is Grayfoot Landstooth. Pardon me on that. Uh, I'm not a nomenclature snob, but um, honestly, I don't always remember the common names. But the Grayfoot Landstooth or Haplotrema snail uh, has a long, neck and this they put the neck into the shell of their prey snail and they have very barbed radula teeth and they actually hook onto the flesh and they eat the snail right in its own shell it can't even escape so they're very recognizable snails too because maybe not on the top uh, although they're very flat kind of a greenish brown snail but when you turn the snail over you can see they have a very wide, what we call the umbilical area. It's just an open, the, the bottom of the shell, if you will. Another thing snails do for the ecosystem is they act as cleanup crews. So oftentimes this particular uh, genus of snails, ventrogens, well, you'll see them eating uh, poop, sometimes deer poop, and you'll see them cleaning up the broken old empty shells of other snails. So think of uh, snails as the cleanup crews of decaying matter on the forest floor. If that's not enough, it gets more interesting. There's even a name for this, malacophyly. This is what is called pollination by snails. This study here is demonstrated that there is a species of snail that has been pollinating a certain species of morning glory. Now this is in India, and I don't know that we have anything equivalent here, but I will tell you Malacophylae is terribly understudied. 
but what the study did was they um, compared the snails to bee pollination. And on rainy, cool days, when bees are not out visiting flowers, the snails work because bees don't like it rainy and cooly. Snails love it when it's rainy and cooly and, and co rainy and cool <laughs> outside. So they're in, in the flowers uh, lapping up nectar and then moving it to another flower and pollinating. And these are uh, uh, microscopic images of the pollen grains that were stuck to the mucus of the snail. Around here, we know that our slugs are responsible for pollinating wild ginger. And this sign was actually not around here. Mm -hmm. I took this sign in Colorado uh, at their botanic gardens. Uh, in my own experience, I have also noted that trillium flowers are being pollinated by slugs, in this case, Aryan slugs. Uh, and this was also on a cool, rainy, wet day when there were no insect pollinators to be seen. And I found the slugs on all the flowers of the trillium in this area, that's the slug's tail, it's going right into the flower and going into the next flower, you can be sure that the pollen grain stuck to its mucus and it was probably pollinating the next flower. Here's one other thing a snail um, that's kind of neat is that when a snail dies, the shell, uh, the snail's body decomposes or gets eaten by an animal and then you're left with these empty shells and they can be used as housing for a lot of insects. In this top photo here, Oftentimes uh, I find this um, uh, like cocoon material, like uh, webbing material, and a lot of insects will do their larval state or pupal stage inside an empty snail shell. It's uh, can't beat it. You know, they're not going to be found. They're snug. And then on these two bottom photos, um, I collected this snail an empty snail shell one day and I tapped it under magnification and I found, oh my goodness, there's all these ants. And um, I don't know if they were larval or pupil ant stages, but they were also in there. And there's certain species of ants that actually use empty snail shells too, amazing. Okay, uh, if you haven't had enough, this is, it, haven't, uh, if you're not impressed by now, let me say, there is something that we call Zombie snails. So the amber snail is a fairly common snail. Probably most of you have seen them. And what in the world is happening here? There's a flatworm parasite that invades the snail. Uh, and uh, but when the snail eats its eggs unknowingly, and then the, the, the worm actually uh, puts the ends of its body up in the snail's tentacles. So it has these two eye tentacles here. And look what it does. How about that? What is going on here? That is the most alien thing. Well, um, this is a, a really interesting parasite in nature because it's other species that it uh, the flatworm gets into is after the snail is birds. So when the bird is coming over, and sees the snail, or doesn't really think of it as a snail, it just says, oh, I want to eat that pulsating worm. So the bird comes along and it will break off the snail's tentacle and take that worm. And then the, the worm completes its life cycle in the bird. Amazing. Nature will always find a way to survive. Okay. Enough of the zombie snails. So, so I hope everybody understands at this point in my presentation, land snails do indeed play vital roles in the ecosystem. However, the problem is many species are going extinct and it's because of our own disturbances we create, pollution, habitat destruction. If you do, uh, if you take out uh, a row of trees or a forest or a grassland and it's going to be used for developers for a business park or Walmart or what have you, that snail habitat is gone forever. What can you do about it? Well, so we're at the last part of my talk. I'm going to explain some ways that we can get involved. One of the first things is identifying land snails. So one of the biggest problems we have 
when we're talking about attractive land, we don't know what's out there. As you can see, so many snails are very small and we have to take our time to find what's out there and assess and make a list of what is there. So learning to identify snails, even on a basic level and helping create lists for species, for scientists, are very valuable things. So um, I'm happy to tell you that most of our land snails and slugs are native. They evolved here. Here's a few examples of them. And some of our snails and slugs are invasive. Where did they come from? Mostly Europe. Some came from Asia. And when did they come? As long as there have been colonists coming from those places to the Americas, they have been bringing snails and slugs unintentionally, even from the time of the Mayflower. Anytime colonists brought over with them favorite fruits and vegetables and plants and pots of soil, they were most definitely bringing snails and slugs and eggs in soil. And we have some genetic evidence that shows that some of our invasive snails and slugs have been here for uh, centuries. So we're going to start with the slugs. As far as in, uh, identifications go, one of the easiest things to look at is a slug. Slugs can have either an anterior positioned mantle. This raised part is called the mantle. So where slugs don't have a shell, they still have a place where their organs are uh, congregated. So in an anterior positioned mantle, the organs are under there. These are mostly our invasive snails. Some snails, I mean slugs, slugs. Uh, some slugs have a mantle that covers the length of the body and those are native. Actually, I shouldn't have said mostly, they're all native. Most of them are phylomycus slugs and New York State, they're actually all uh, in the family Phylomycidae. Snail shells are a great way to, uh, uh, something great to have to identify because not only can you identify when the snail is alive, but you could also identify after the snail is long gone, been eaten by an animal, deceased, whatever. But the shell persists in nature for a certain amount of time before it degrades. So what we do uh, to help identifications is first look at the different general shapes of the shell. And below you can see that the uh, basic forms have these names and those are some examples of them. Remember those tiny snails? Well, back to that. We have to uh, adjust our eyes or get magnification and know that our search image is very, very tiny. This is a teeny tiny snail, uh, a Valonia snail that lives often in the grass. And you can see it just with the roots of the grass and that is the tip of my index finger, fingernail. That's how tiny they are. So to help you with finding snails in the field, you can, there's a variety of magnifiers available. This one here has a light and that helps a lot if you're in dim light. Um, and they could be as simple as these loops. It's great to have a string around them. You keep them around your neck so you never lose them. And I just received this one as a gift and this slides out. It has several different kinds of lights and it has different magnification. Very, very handy to have and essential. How are you gonna handle those tiny snails? If you wanna take them back to your workbench or your studio or your, your wherever you do your naturalist work, handling them is uh, best done by a damp paintbrush or a Q-tip. That way they stick to that. I don't recommend picking them up with your fingertips because invariably you're going to crush the shell of your favorite snail. They're very delicate, the, the little tiny shells. So this is a great way to handle them. Then what do you do after you have some snails and you've taken some photos? Our naturalist is a great way that we can make species lists and there's plenty of data in there. I have to say though, I find that the iNaturalist app that can identify the photos that you upload is not good at identifying land snails. It just doesn't know. 
For identifying land snails, we need to provide multiple shell views. This, this is called the apical view, the umbilical view, and this side view here, if you will, is, is uh, the um, apertural view. And you really need all three because we're looking at how high the shell is, we're looking at how many coils, and we're looking at the umbilical features. It could be open, it could be closed, all different kinds. So that is one way that really helps you take whoops, useful photographs. We have currently known about 115 land snail species in New York State. And again, that does include slugs. And uh, everyone asks me for a New York State field guide to land snails and slugs. Unfortunately, it's not been published yet, but some colleagues of mine have been working on it for a number of years. We're hoping to find uh, a publisher for that. Um, but meanwhile, you can look up some publications that are available online. And again, if you're watching this YouTube uh, version later on, you can pause the video so that you can take down the URLs and look them up. Um, but that, that can help a lot. So a malacologist is somebody who studies mollusks. There's no particular word for somebody who studies land snails, but uh, we call ourselves malacologists too. Um, and these are the kinds of things that we're looking for. These are what we study. This is what we publish on. Uh, and especially, again, the what kind, what's out there and how many. That all comes from making species lists. A very basic thing. The, the samples that we take from the field end up in museums and they can be referenced just like a library. Museum collections are like a, a library of um, the uh, species, the, the uh, locality, it, all the information is there. Uh, we also want to know what could be conserved, what should be conserved. If we don't know what's out there and how many, how will we know to make these recommendations? You can learn more about malacology in general, by the way, if you go to the American Malacological website, which is just www.malacological.org. So here's a local project that you could get involved in if you want. One of our important and critically endangered land snails in New York State is the Chittenango Ove Amber Snail. This little snail looks a lot like probably snails you see in your backyard, but I will, a word of warning, here, the amber, it's part of the amber snail family. The amber snails look very much alike. There's a few defining features of this particular snail, but the most interesting and uh, frightening thing is that their population is down to one tiny area of a few square meters at the base of Chittenango Falls in upstate New York. So just these, these few rocky, craggy ledges with some vegetation. So every year, the crew, I volunteered one year with, with them, we go out and we collect snails and we find ones that have been numbered from previous years, ones that don't have a number, get this little tiny bee tag, it doesn't interfere with the snail's life. Uh, and then uh, subsequent years, they're checked upon to see if they're still surviving, can be found, all that. Here's some of the figures from recently. We don't have 2020 figures yet because the season's just beginning to do any field work at all. But the po wild population has gone down to 50 compared to uh, at least a couple hundred in two years of pro uh, ago. Captive snails are, uh, captive breeding program has, now has about 400 snails uh, and the crew is always releasing back the COAS is short for Chetmingo Ovate Amber Snail to the um, original place where they are um, native to. Uh, the, the group is trying to also uh, continue to breed the snails in the lab and back breed to cr uh, create more, uh, hopefully enough diversity in the population. Obviously the gene pool is very limited at this point that's some of the things that they're doing. Um, if you want, if you're interested in accumulating Master Naturalist volunteer hours, contact Cody Gilbertson. She's the leader of the project. Uh, the project started at SUNY ESF 
and it's now a co-run between SUNY ASF and the Rosamond Gif Gifford Zoo in Syracuse. But you can visit these links here to learn more about the projects. Also, you can uh, like them on Facebook and see updates on their work. What can you do right at your own home? Uh, I uh, like to help people make recommendations for keeping the, especially the native snails on their property if possible. Uh, snails don't like a golf course. If you can, uh, mow infrequently, leave parts of your property as natural habitat without grass. And that means leaving fallen trees and fallen logs, leaf litter, brush piles, all that is good for snail life. Uh, mushrooms and fungi are good food for a lot of snails. Um, beech trees are particularly good for snails if you have any on your property because they have a high calcium content. When they drop their leaves in the fall, the leaves become incorporated into the soil and eventually break down and add calcium to the soil, which the snails like. I recommend to you avoid using fertilizers, any kind of chemicals on your property if you can. Uh, it's not good really for any wildlife if you're looking to create a natural habitat on your property. Also, when you pick up a snail, this doesn't go just for at home. Always return it to the place you found it. They don't travel much in life. They will travel a little bit and uh, always get, remember that homing behavior we talked about before. They will tend to return to the same place uh, and they don't uh, travel far in life at all. Finally, uh, I used to get asked this question, well, I still get asked this question all the time, what can I do about the invasive pest snails in my garden uh, and my crops and my strawberries and they're eating everything? Well, that's not my area of expertise, but I've been asked so many times that I finally have some answers for you in a slide that can probably help. If you can, I've noticed with my own garden, just picking out the slugs, hand removal of slugs and snails in your garden, those are all invasives in the palm of my hand. Take them out and get rid of them. Um, you can feed them to your ducks <laughs> or chickens or guinea fowl if you have them. If you don't have anything else, you can, draw, you can put them in the freezer for quick and painless death, alcohol, whatever you want. There's many ways that you can get rid of them. Keeping them out in the first place, there are a lot of copper containing products on the market, such as this mesh or this tape, and supposedly these keep them out. I personally have not tried them. There's also iron three phosphate preparations such as sluggo pellets comes in a pellet form that you just sprinkle in your garden. It's safe for other wildlife, but toxic to snails. So that's another possible solution. And with that, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, say thank you very much, everybody, for your attention and for taking an interest in snails and being here today. And I'm going to open the floor now for any questions. Thank you. Oops, stop the share. Okay. Thank you very much, Marla. Um, does anybody have any questions? I have one here from Frida, who is wondering, um, who is wondering why are they not releasing some chitinango ovates into the wild in similar protected habitats? Oh, I see. Um, that's a good, uh, do I need to stop? Do I need no. To? no, we could. Uh, no, oh, I did, okay. no, I need to stop sharing my screen. I thought I did. That. Oh, no, you did. You're off. I did, I did. We're yes. good. Okay. Um, that's a good question. Uh, and and the, the chitinango ovate amber snail people do get asked that a lot. We can't. Uh, you don't want to take an endemic species and introduce it into another area. Uh, I suppose it's, you could say it's been done with big game animals and uh, herding animals, but it really doesn't work for snails. There's so much we don't know about snails. And what we do know about snails in my own studies are that snail species are very particular to a certain habitat, microhabitat and area because of the soil chemistry primarily. Uh, and that's a very complicated thing that we, again, we don't know exactly why, but it's highly unlikely that those snails are going to survive anywhere else but where they evolved, which is in the Chittenango Falls area. Okay. 
Thank you for that. I had a question, Marla, and that was um, the numbers dropped from over 200 um, in 2018 to only 50 in 2019. Was that a particularly precipitous drop off or um, and and or do they have any idea why such a, a large drop that year? It, it is a big drop off, unfortunately. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I actually put the question to them and I'm waiting for a response. It could have something to do with the weather conditions. Uh, it could have something to do with keeping visitors out of that area. There's a fence and there's signage that say, please do not enter here. Endangered species lives here. Unfortunately, people don't listen. And it, even in human foot traffic, trampling a protected area can reduce the numbers of snails in their habitat. So those are two of the reasons, weather and human traffic. Okay. We don't know the rest. All right, thank you. Um, Selma asks, what are the snails that go crunch under my feet when I'm in Tompkins County Edwards Lake Preserve? And how do I make sure I don't bring them home with me? <laughs> oh my, um, uh, the snails that go crunch. Uh, can we uh, <laughs> talk about what they look like? That's very hard for me to, to know. I've not been to Edwards Preserve. Selma, if you wanna unmute yourself, you may, and then you can describe them. Um, hi, yeah. Let's see, I hate to bring up iNaturalist, but they, that came up with, a, and I don't know how to pronounce it, so I will spell it, C-E-P-A-E-A, -E -A, growth okay. snail? Cipaeae moralis, probably. Uh, Cipaeae moralis is, it's an introduced, it's not horribly invasive, but it's not from here. They are originally from Great Britain and mainland Europe. They've been here for probably centuries and uh they um you know you don't want to bring them home with you i suppose just check your shoes and your car after you've been to that preserve and just make sure they haven't crawled up on your tires and you know i'm sorry they're going crunch under your feet they're they they tend to be numerous in a very limited area i've noticed they have these sort of discrete populations where they're all uh, you could have um, uh, hundreds of them and then walk five feet away and not have any, so. <laughs> right, well, there are a lot of them there should you ever want to find any. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see, we have another question. Um, do birds ingest the entire snail, shell and all, or do they extract the organism from the shell like chipmunks? Oh, oh, that's that's a great question. Uh, I noticed different things with different birds. So, so the turkeys often eat those tiny snails and they swallow shell and all. And uh, I guess in their gizzard, they're able to, to uh, crunch up the snails and then and digest them. The wood thrush does something interesting. I, I had meant to talk about one of the photos that I have there. If you're ever taking a walk in the woods and you find a tree stump or a rock, if you notice broken snail shells on it, that was more than likely the work of a wood thrush. The wood thrush oh. would take the snail and beat it against the rock, <coughs> using the rock like an anvil or, or the stump. And the, they pretend to like to get the fleshy part and not eat the shell. So those are two examples of different things. Different birds do different things. Yeah. Huh. So Marla, that's interesting as a follow-up to that. I thought one of the reasons that wood, wood thrushes declined where there was um, acid rain and fewer snails is because they weren't ingesting the calcium from the shells and therefore their egg shells were weaker. They weren't actually producing very strong eggs themselves. Okay. Uh, no, really, um, the wood thrushes are getting most of their calcium, it's believed, from the flesh of the snail. Oh, okay. The snail. Just what they're able to digest for whatever oh. reason. But okay. It's the decline of snails itself that have caused the problems for the wood thrushes. Okay, good to know. Uh, let's see. Um, we have, with climate change becoming more and more evident, what is the prognosis for the snails and what they do within the ecosystem? Uh, it's, it's a, that's the million dollar question. A climate change, is, it's, it's been shown to, to be difficult on, on snails. We have uh, unusual weather patterns, we have droughts, we have floods, neither of which snails are really able to survive well. 
uh, prognosis is not looking good, I'm afraid to say. Uh, we, we can only do our best. We can, again, lists of snails being able to identify and know what's there, um, what they're doing in the ecosystem. Unfortunately, snails are not animals that can pick up and get away from fire, flood, drought. They're right there. They're in situ. They can't escape. So whatever happens to a local area is, is uh, going to affect the snails of that area. I wish I had better news. It's, it it uh, breaks my heart to uh, think about climate change and its effects on all, all life. But yes, snails, in fact, yes. All right, a uh, guy asks, I have a lot of quarter-sized snails on my Nassau County property. It's all the same species. Any idea about the species? And Guy, if you want to unmute yourself and you know describe it further, you're welcome to do that. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I've, I've I've enjoyed them. I have all gardens in my yard. I don't have I don't have a stitch of grass, uh, and I have lot and I have lots of the species of of, of snail. And uh, I have no idea what it is, if it's native or not. It's about the size of a quarter. I, I mean, I, I I can't describe it any further. Maybe uh, you know, a kind of a light color, a, a, a kind of a beige color. Do some of them have stripes? I, I would have to take a closer look. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I, quarter size could very well be that same Cipaea nemoralis snail that we had talked about with another question. Because uh, there are a lot of populations of them throughout New York State. Could be that. If you, if you want, you can send me some pictures. If you do, send me three shell views if possible. Okay. I'll do my best. Yeah. But we do have nat we do fortunately have a nat a lot of native snails that are about the size of a quarter, also. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Okay. All right. The next question is: How can I? This is from Kathy Kelly. How can I get started studying snails in Queens, New York, Alley Pond Park? Ah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know Alley Pond Park particular, but I lived for a long time in Brooklyn, and I grew up near Brooklyn and I remember finding snails in my Brooklyn little postage stamp backyard and they were all of the tiny sort. Um, uh, there is a good book that was published I believe in the 1960s and it's called the, the Land Snails and Slugs of, I think it's called Terrestrial Mollusks of New York City Area. If you can find it, it's it's a delightful little book with nice little black and white ink drawings in it, um, and uh, I know one of one of the authors. He actually passed a few years ago, um, at the in his nineties. Anyway, that's a great book. Uh, let's see, what could I do to? If you want to email me, you're welcome to, and I can get you the title of that book, and maybe you could find it somewhere online. Okay. All right. Thank you, Marta. Um, here's another question. Can we also assume that small snails with shells found in gardens are also not native? I find many and so do not use sluggo in the garden, even though the slugs are numerous and destructive. I am willing to bet that your slugs, if they're in a garden, are invasive. Okay. These are snails, she said. Oh, just snails? With shells, yeah. In addition to her slugs, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, one at a time. So I'll answer slugs first because that's easy. <laughs> slugs that appear in a garden are invasive almost invariably because our native slugs are in the family Phylomycidae and they're a very different thing. I had some photos of them in the presentation. They only eat fungi and lichens. That's pretty much it. You could not find a Phylomyca snail eating your carrots or tomatoes or squash. Regarding the small snails in your garden, they're more than likely invasive too. Uh, in my garden, I also often find, um, I'm trying to think of the common name. I think it's called the cellar snail. They often appear in gardens and they're, they're quite small. They're maybe four millimeters at the greatest shell width. Um, they don't do a ton of damage. If you have the Cipaea nemoralis, the quarter size snails in your garden, they're also introduced, they'll eat your stuff. So hand picking tends to be better than you think. If, if you're really at it and picking off the snails by hand, do it first thing in the morning or in the evening when they're out. 
and uh, discarding them in whatever way you do you prefer. Uh, you can manage them pretty well without using Slogo. Okay, thank you, Mar Marla. Um, there's one last question, one last quick one. Um, how many species of slugs are here in New York? Uh, slugs, sl I, I would have to look at my list and, and uh, parse that apart, but uh, there are about 115 snails and slug species mm -hmm. in New York State. Yeah, okay. smaller percentage of those are, are slugs. Okay. Thank you very much, Marla. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now and then we can um, continue a little discussion if you'd like. Sure. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you very Thanks much for, for sharing your questions. expertise.